Once I remember that part so clearly. It was April the 16th, the day before Easter. My fiance, Eddie Cochran, and his fellow singer and friend, Gene Vincent, had just finished a triumphant eight-week tour in England. Now, Eddie, Gene, and Pat Tompkins, the road manager, and myself were in a hired car on our way to London Airport. Soon we would be home, back in the United States with our families and our loved ones. Soon, Eddie and I would be married. It was a long drive. The chauffeur told us it would take eight hours to get to the airport. We were all too tired to take the train. We thought we'd be much more comfortable sitting in the back seat of that car. Why are we going so fast, I guess, the driver. Don't you think that we should slow down? Now there three steps to are three three steps, to steps to heaven. Just three listen steps to heaven. and you three will plainly see. And as life travels on and things do go wrong, just follow steps to heaven. Steps three one, steps to heaven. two, and three. The concert at the Bristol Hippodrome finished around 10.30 and the Ford Consul taxi arrived about quarter to 11. The singers came out of the Hippodrome by the side door and the first in the back of the car was Jean Vincent followed by Eddie Cochran and then Sharon Sheely. And in the front was the driver and Patrick Tompkins through Bath, out to Chippingham on the A4. And as they travelled along the road, they came to some traffic lights. Now, if the traffic lights had been red, then Eddie might still be alive today, but they weren't, they were green. So they went straight through the traffic lights, still building up speed. They obviously wanted to get to London Airport as quick as they could, because they had to catch the midday flight, the 101 flight, from Heathrow to New York, then going on to Los Angeles, where Eddie was heading for. Now you chop on that, and I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll get set to bring a young man on, uh, who we always enjoy having. It's a young man who sings a little thing called, uh, Come on, everybody, Eddie Cochran! <laughs> attention for a moment I'm gonna tell you what's going on I never swear anyway uh, I'll tell you now the coach is outside and it's gonna leave within a couple of minutes and it will take you to Chippenham via Bath and then from Chippenham to St. Martin's Hospital 
You'll arrive in Chippenham around about two o'clock, St. Martin's Hospital round about four. So arrive back here at six o'clock to 6.15. Uh, I think there'll be some food on or something, I don't know. But then tonight, a bit Trinity Social Club, a disco, a film, and a good band. So that tells you everything what's on. So, if you'll depart in an orderly manner, don't kick any cars or anything on the way out. Surest memories of Eddie Will, our hearts forever fill. With music from an epic age, and rock and roll filled every stage. He saw the summer of his fame, autumn, winter never came. In the springtime of the year, he took three steps of heaven from here. Eddie Cochran will always live in the minds of all the true Teddy boys who ever listened to rock and roll. Eddie Cochran still lives, same as Elvis still lives, or Buddy Ollie, or any of the others who've, who've died. Their music lives on. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do, but there ain't no cure for the He had the charisma, and I know a lot of people use that word nowadays, but he had the stage magic. In other words, I think he was actually born to be a really world-class star. When he came on stage, his clothing was absolutely unique for that period of time. Silver and gold waistcoats, black leather jeans, his swept back hair, and of course that lovely red guitar that he just seemed to move it around like a uh, like a steam train wheel going around and around. It was absolutely superb and it was tremendous excitement but at the same time he also had a lot of grace about moving across the stage and that was absolutely unique. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do but there ain't no cure for the summertime blues. There's a kind of a sense of urgency in his voice. He reminds me of a of a typical teenager. And when I met him, he looked exactly as the photographs were, but even better, he had an absolutely perfect complexion. He was one of the, one of the few guys I met, he didn't have one spot on his face. And um, every hair was absolutely in place. He looked, he looked fantastic, he really did. Sharon Sheely was an American songwriter and she used to uh, help out on some of Ellie's songs. She wrote songs for Richie Valens and for Ricky Nelson and she used to be one of these people that came up with the sort of love songs that a lot of the, uh, the performers were performing at that particular time. We may stop loving to watch bugs burning But he can't take the place of my <laughs> Every personal appearance he did, he couldn't turn around with that smacking right into me, you know, I mean, I was like all of a 16 and, you know, just barely getting the braces off my teeth, you know, and I mean, I was just, I just, that was just my waking moment, you know, was Eddie Cochran and going to sleep, you know, how to get Eddie Cochran, and um, I, uh, I just pursued and carried on for, we're out about 50 pairs of tennis shoes. And every time, I remember once going to the office to talk to his manager about something and Eddie was in there having a meeting with him. And I remember I overheard Eddie say, you know, Christ, every time I turn around, I smack into this kid that she have to be everywhere I go. But nothing could deter me from this ultimate project of mine, of Eddie Cochran. It just, it's, it just went along like that for about a year, a little over a year, uh, until we were in New York once, 
and in fact it was New Year's Eve and Eddie had everyone into his, he had a big suite in the hotel at the Sheridan in New York and Buddy Holly was there and the Crickets were there and the Everly Brothers were there, Buddy Knox. Uh, his bass player called me. I was up in my room and he said, Eddie wants you to come to the New Year's Eve party. Well, now mind you, prior to knowing that I was going to go get to go to New York with Eddie at the same time because we had the same manager, I went out and just blew every penny I had in my savings account practically on this just knock them dead, kill them wardrobe, you know. And I wore a different outfit three times a day, you know. I, uh, I did my hair platinum blonde. Now, who cannot notice this platinum blonde, right? I did everything in the world to get his attention. Nothing at all. I mean, Frankie Avalon asked me out one night, and some of the other guys asked me out, but nothing from Eddie Cochran at all. No acknowledgement whatsoever. So that night when the guy would call up and say, come to the New Year's Eve party, I sort of, you know, I looked at my whole wardrobe and just blew a raspberry at it, like, you know, a lot of good you did me, fellas. And I just scrubbed my face, took all that makeup off, and I remember I put my hair in two pigtails, two braids, and I put on a sweatshirt and a pair of Levi's and tennis shoes and went down to that New Year's Eve party. Well, when the party was over and everybody was leaving, Eddie asked me to stay one to talk to me. So when everybody was gone, we were just the two of us were sitting there. And I remember he looked over at me and he said to me, are you in love with me? And I remember how embarrassed I was. I mean, I just, I just wanted to die on the spot of embarrassment, you know, like, I mean, I wanted to say, you know, well, what makes you think something like that? You know, I mean, I've only chased you for two years. You know, every time you turn around, of course, you, you know, I was just, I was, and I said, that's a very embarrassing thing to ask someone, and I resent that you, and I was in the middle of this tirade of reprimanding him for that rude question when he looked at me and said, well, you sure better be, because I'm sure in love with you. And that was it. Uh, it was the first time. We had never had a date. We had never kissed. And then he came over and sat down next to me and kissed me for the first time, and the bells rang. Like in movies, I could hear them all over New York City. And then he said to me, will you marry me? And I said, you bet. And I looked up and I said, when did you wonder in which of these great outfits I had bought and had, <laughs> had done the trick? Which one of my investments? When did you first know that you were in love? And he said, the first time I ever saw you. Well, with that, of course, I want to take off my shoe and beat him over the head. You know, I said, you made me, you know, I chased you for two years. And, I made a fool out of myself in front of everybody in the industry. And he said, I had to be real sure. He said, did you ever fall in love with Ricky Nelson? And I said, no. And he said, any of the other guys? And I said, no. And he said, you love me? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you see, I'm not so dumb. I just had to be real, real sure before I gave my heart away. And that's how it happened. Hey, Teresa, I saw you in Scoop today, this is what I got to say. Mm, you're a honey, a honey, worth more to me than money, cuter to me than a rosebud. I love you forever if you be my girl. I don't know just exactly uh, when it was that she met him, uh, but uh, she she can tell you. And uh, he didn't tell me too much about her until just before he went to England. And then he talked about her. You know, it was funny about those two. She thought he didn't like her, and he thought she didn't like him. They found out over in England. After he got over there, they, uh, he uh, called her and asked her to come over. And uh, she came over, and I guess he was so happy to see her. You know, Eddie was not very impressed with himself. I think he underrated himself. But he was determined that he was going to be a star someday, and I think he made it in England.
But I'm, we're very pleased to have you with us on Saturday Club this week, Eddie Cochran. We've had lots of requests for your recorded numbers. Here's just one of them. Maybe you'd read it for us, would you? If you finish that hamburger, Eddie. Uh, thank you very much. This is from Hazel Fisher for a friend, Don Cale of Southampton on her 16th birthday. Gotta get over the record machine when it comes to rock and she's a queen. We love to dance on a Saturday night. All alone where I can hold her tight, but she lives on the 20th floor of town. The elevator's broken down, so I walk one. In the staid, respectable neighborhood of Kensington, there's a nice upper income bracket block of flats. Inside, a doormat, over which pass some rather flashy feet. The doormat belongs to Mr. Lawrence Morris Parnes, who also owns a batch of golden boys. He creates them and manages them and their money. There's Ron Witcherly, 17, known to his fans as Billy Fury, guaranteed a thousand pounds in his first year. Roy Taylor, 18, alias Vince Eager, 5,000 pounds by his fifth year. John Askew, or Johnny Gentle, 22, from Merseyside. And Duffy Power, real name Raymond Howard, 17. All eager, power, gentle fury in the lucrative business, as someone said, of putting teenage growing pains to music. I plan to bring over, or to be one of the first, uh, I don't know, pop promoters or producer, whatever you care to call me, to bring over American pop stars to Britain, because in those days, um, they just weren't appearing in the UK, and yet UK audiences wanted to see them. I had a very good friend uh, in the business called Jaime Zoll, and he said, well, I think uh, if you're going to go for American pop stars, obviously we can't get Presley. We did try two or three times, but we can't get Presley. Oh, what about Gene Vincent? And I said, I think it's a very good idea. But surely, isn't he going to be a very big price? You know, he said, well, I think we can negotiate him pretty reasonable for a six day a week out of seven tour. So we started negotiations going, and if I remember correctly, it's very difficult to remember back quite a few years that far, I think we finished up on a deal with Gene Vincent's manager at 1,500 pounds a week for six days a week for, I think it was four or five weeks. Of course, if you compared that with today's prices, it'd be around 45,000 pounds a week, I suppose. And I don't know, after booking Gene Vincent, uh, three, four weeks went by and I got one of my telepathic feelings that all wasn't going to be well. We needed somebody else. And I'd been reading about this up and coming um, young, singer guitarist Eddie Cochran. Phoned my friend who was doing the negotiating and said, what do you think about Eddie Cochran to join the tour? He said, very good idea indeed. And he said, as a matter of fact, we can probably get him very, very reasonably. I said, really? Because I know that he's beginning to make a name for himself in America. And anyway, the long and short of it was Eddie Cochran was booked within about 10 days of my talking to my friend. And I think Eddie was paid £250 a week plus some expenses, which I suppose would be equivalent today to about, um, I don't know, ten, twelve thousand pounds £12,000 a week, something like that. Do you rechristen all your boys? Oh, yes, I think this is terribly important. Um, otherwise, they, they would go on the stage with peculiar names that wouldn't be part of their makeup. For example, you might get Fred Bloggs or something like that. Uh, you could never have a rock and roll singer by, by that name. And well, their names are a bit peculiar as it is, aren't they? Pride, Gentle, Fury, Eager. Why do you choose names like that? Well, this means something, you see. Uh, for example, Marty Wilde, as you probably know, his real name was Reg Smith. Uh, he was a big, tall lad of six foot four uh, who had to be kept friendly, yet he had to be kept uh, wild. So, hence Marty Wilde. Marty's very friendly and Wilde shows that little wild trait in him, you see. Son, you 
did wobbly. His concerts, uh, he was using my my uh, my band, the backing band, and big Jim Sullivan. Um, I spoke to Jim after a few nights of the tour, and um, I said, you know, how's it going? He said, oh, this this guy is sensational. I mean, he really is. He said, you know, he said you're our governor and all that. He said, but this guy is absolutely sensational. He said he's marvelous to work with, and he's fan. I mean. For Jim, and you see, he was a musician as well as being a, you know, a fine rock singer, and that meant a lot to Jim, and um, that's why I think he acquired so many fans. Oh well, I cut across, shorty, shorty, cut across. That's what Miss Lucy said. Cut across, shorty, shorty, cut across. Give to you out of nowhere. When you're working his songs, but you're very aware. Of, of his lyrics, he had a good sense, a very good sense of humour, Eddie. Very wry sense of humour, <clears throat> and uh, that comes across in, in things like "Cut Across Shorty," and which is basically uh, a funny song. And uh, on the other, on the other hand, "Summertime Blues," the lyrics to that are so advanced. I mean, who would say? I mean, even Presley wasn't wasn't uh, recording material like that because the the lyrics were, you know, like I call my congressman. He said, "Quote." You know, I'd like to help you, son, but, it's, but you're too young to vote. And, well, it's like a congressman. Who's going to use congressman? It was more like a, a kind of thing Dylan did later, you know. He was like a, almost like a gunfighter from the West. He had that kind of image. And he attracted, he, had, he definitely attracted a kind of, uh, the, uh, you know, the idol worship. He was lucky in so much as the, the guitar, um, will always be a kind of a, a romantic thing, you know, there's a romantic image of a man with a guitar. And, uh, he was a great player. Sort of boy, the sort of boy you'd expect Elvis Presley to have been. Uh, where was this boy born? Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Well, why wouldn't he be quiet and provincial? Yeah, and very modest type of boy, because at that time he was a cult even then. Why was that? Because his music was so different. It was, it was probably. I mean, we were all doing pop stuff, pop music and copying, and he was doing original stuff, writing it himself. I think that was the difference between Eddie Cochran and the rest of us at the time. I think he was the first true rock singer. He wasn't pop, he was a rock singer. Well, I don't think he lived long enough to be a great influence, like Beatles were a great influence. But he had a fantastic cult influence, like rather well, like James Dean did. Eddie was a great sort of driver. He used to get on the stage and don't know what old rotten old amplifier he used to have. It always used to sound like Eddie Cochran because he, he he'd sort of he had a sort of strange style that we hadn't seen at that point in this country. Of course, we all do it now. You know, like the bottom end stuff where he plays. Play the... That that sort of rhythm. Now, normally, if I hadn't seen him play it. Uh, that I would play that that figure up here. But 
it's all wrong. He'd play a shape down here. Mm -hmm. All the shapes were different, you see. And that was the way he played. And the great th one of the great things I learned off of Cochrane was uh, the second string on instead of a third string. Because in those days, the guitars over there, uh, were they had a, uh, an unwound first, an unwound second string, like just plain steel. And the third string was a wound string, like these heavy strings down the bottom. And Cochrane used to slip a second string on, so he was able to bend it. So he could play things like, uh, uh, you bend a note. And he could bend that. But, uh, I mean, everybody does it now. They even sell guitar strings. There's not such a thing as a wound third now, but the first time I ever saw it used was with Eddie Cochran. It did me a big favour because I, I said to him, here, Ed, what you got on there? He said, it's a second string. I said, that's a good idea. He said, yeah, well, don't tell anybody. So I said, right, so I put it on my guitar, and as a result of doing it, I got loads of work. I was doing all the sessions because I was the only one that could bend the string. And all these old guys are saying, how does he do that? You know, how does he do that? I used to put my guitar in a case quick so I couldn't see, you know what I mean? Now they all do it now. <laughs> half the size of this facility as it is now and Eddie Cochran would be probably singing right about over here this is where he would be sitting and standing and playing his guitar and probably over there is the control room and the studio was buffing that wall to a little bit past this glass window here another two feet and Eddie would stay over here and play and sing and, and uh, face the booth and uh, right over here is where Eddie used to stand and do most of all his vocals and you're gonna be also sorry. You treat me this way. Eddie could go in and make a record by himself if he had to. Uh, he felt the guitar parts. Uh, he felt the bass line. He felt the rhythm pattern. Uh, he would kind of talk things over. There was never any written arrangements. These were all head arrangements. These were all concept records, records that had a, a personality of Eddie Cochran in them. These are all his ideas. Eddie, uh, we've already heard how you play a whole lot of other instruments too, is it so? Well, uh, really not a whole lot. I play uh, bass and drums and piano and guitar a little bit. How long are you staying over in England? Not as long as Gene? No, not quite as long as Gene. I'll be here until April 17th, then I go home for 10 days. And then I'm back near the end of April and uh, stay here for 10 more weeks. Oh, quite a long time. That'll be for the same sort of deal with a package tour. Yeah, it'll be all, so. all with Gene again. Huh? Yes. Um, what, what do you have in mind for your career when you get back home? Is there anything particular you want to do? Well, I want to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> All my tours were always planned uh, like a military campaign. We had maps on the wall with flags and charts in the office and uh, the other capacities. Uh, we had statistics on the amount of people in the different towns, so on and so forth. After the first week, we were sold out for the entire tour. Eddie was the obvious star of that show. Gene had headlined before Eddie joined the tour. And when Eddie joined the tour after about two weeks, they wanted Eddie to headline because Eddie got much more response than Gene Vincent. Yeah, just give me some time on my hand. But uh, when they approached Eddie with changing the 
the marquee and making him the headliner. He said, absolutely not. You know, he wouldn't hear of it. Because he was very fond of Gene, and he was like a brother to Gene Vincent. He took care of Gene. He really did. He looked after him. And he knew Gene couldn't handle it. Gene emotionally could not handle the blow of being taken off being headliner and putting Eddie above him. It wasn't that important to Eddie. Towards the uh, latter part of touring with Gene, he, he was really sick guy, you know, and he used to sit up in his room and sometimes he'd be almost suicidal, you know, he, with that bloody bad leg of his. And we'd sit around in the room playing until he went off to sleep, so he was okay. And then, well, if we were going down on a train, for instance, to a gig, there'd be Vincent and Eddie. And he used to look to Eddie as a sort of father figure, and Eddie really used to look after him. And they'd sit in this first class compartment, and uh, he'd, he'd send someone down, go get Joe, tell him to bring his guitar. So I'd come down and sit in the first class and play with him the whole journey, you know. Many of the time, a ticket collector's come around and off me. Back to the second class, and he said, oh, it's okay, you can pay to get some money. Let's go. Well, G Man, G Man, never lose to searching for the place where he played his crew. Oh, we were looking, trying to book him, but my family kept on cooking. Right, right. With uh, Ed, uh, he had this personality where he, he kind of took over. I mean, when he was in the room, the whole center of attraction was there, you know, with him. And uh, Gene Vincent was uh, used to get very uptight about it, um, and uh, he'd uh, sort of goad Eddie, and you know, uh, especially if they had a few drinks. Um, but I think deep down uh, they they got on okay, and, and they looked after each other because Eddie used, was very very homesick all the time he was here. I mean, he, he, I can't tell you how much it cost him in phone calls to America to speak to Mom and I, you know, um, because uh, I would say. On an, on an average of once a day, he would ring L.A. And when he was on the road, did he used to keep in contact with you all the time? He certainly did. What did he, what did he say? <laughs> he, he always called me Shrimper. Called you what? Shrimper. And uh, when he would get ready to come home, he always called me and said, Shrimper? I'd say yes. He'd say, Put on a pot of beans, I'm coming home. The sun is out, the sky is blue. There's not a cloud to spoil of you, but it's raining. Raining in my heart. Uh, Manchester was a bad time. In Manchester, uh, Eddie went through a, a very different, he went through a silent kind of change within himself. I mean, it wasn't, unless you knew him very, very well, you couldn't, you wouldn't have picked up on it or noticed it. He did a couple things he'd never done before. One, he asked me to go to a record shop and get all the Buddy Holly albums. He had never, he would not listen to a Buddy Holly record since the time of Buddy's death. Eddie had been booked on this tour and he had called Buddy and asked Buddy to go on the tour with him and Buddy said he'd just gotten married and he didn't want to really leave his wife and he was settling in and Eddie said, you know, we always tour together. You know, come on, Holly. Come on, man. And Holly, you know, said, okay. You know, it was very hard for those two to say no to each other. So he signed on the tour and, of course, the ultimate sad part was that at the last minute they pulled Eddie off the tour to do the Ed Sullivan show and Buddy was killed. But it's raining, raining in my heart. Eddie changed when Buddy died. But he did ask me to go out and get all his records. He said he wanted to hear the Buddy Holly records. So I went out and bought him all the Buddy Holly records I could find in a record shop. And he sat for hours just listening to them on the record player. And I would say, isn't that making you sad? Why are you doing this? And he'd say, it doesn't make me sad anymore. It's going to be all right now. There was always this mystery, this, this feeling that he, I knew he knew something I didn't know. 
Uh, then after about two or three days, one night, it was about one-ish, I think, in the morning. It was quite late at night, and I was asleep, and I woke up to the screaming. And I went to the top of the stairs in my robe and looked down, and Eddie was pounding his fists on the manager of the hotel we were staying. And when the guy opened the door, Eddie just grabbed him by the lapels of his robe, and he was just shaking him, you know, and he kept screaming over and over again, I'm going to die, my God, and nobody can stop me. Nobody can stop it. Look at him. What's all this? Never thought I'd do this before But here I am a knocking on the door My car's out front and it's all mine Just a 41 foot, not a 59 I got that girl and I'm a thinking to myself She's sure fine looking, man. Wow, she's something else. Eddie fan, hmm? Yeah. He crashed around here somewhere. Yeah, he crashed on the A4. Far away. What's that? Some time ago, huh? 1960. 60? Hmm. Long time. Smashed his head. What'd he do? Come off the road. It's a taxi. Him and Gene Vincent. Uh -huh. Come back from a gig at the Hippodrome. Taxi crashed. Bristol, Bristol, Hipper Yeah. Yeah. Here's a lamp post. Step one. You find some girl to love. <laughs> Step two. She falls in love with you. <laughs> Step three. You kiss and hold her tightly. Well, that's sure. sure. Seems like heaven to me. The formula for heaven is very simple. The Ford console was driving along very fast, and as it took the bend, it hit the curb across the road and both the tyres went down and then the Ford console swung right round and started coming backwards. Now with that, Eddie, in time-honoured fashion, caught all of the girl, Sharon Sheely, American songwriter, ran the net and pulled her down over to his lap and covered her up. As the car was spinning backwards, it went straight into a concrete lamp post and all the passengers in the back went right up into the roof and were flung right out onto the grass verge. Now, while this was going on, people, the neighbours, came out in their night clothes to give comfort to the other passengers. And remember, there was still luggage and everything all over the road. Pictures, sheet music, records were splashed all over the road. Wreckage up the road. It was, it was a disaster actually, an absolute disaster because no one knew who they were or anything else. So when the ambulance came, they were picked up and they were rushed to St. Martin's Hospital. Now they got to St. Martin's Hospital around about 1.30 in the morning. Now within the next four hours, no fewer than nine doctors would be called to Eddie's bedside. Now, with that, one of the doctors was coming out after seeing Eddie. He looked very worried and he went over to have a look and to have a look to see how Jean Vincent was. And Jean Vincent looked up to the doctor and said, if you can save Eddie's life, I'll give you $10,000. And the surgeon said, you can offer me $10 million. There's nothing more we can do. 
My next memory was just um, coming to on some wet, damp grass out in a cow pasture where we'd all been thrown from the car. I remember Jane Vincent crawling over to see how I was feeling, telling me that Eddie was fine. He was sitting in the back seat of the car having a cigarette. He was just a bit shaken up. And right then and there, I knew. Because if there was any way Eddie could have gotten to me, he would have been there beside me, not Jean Vincent. And then I went out again. And the next time I came to you, I was in an ambulance. And I was holding Eddie's hand. He looked so beautiful. And I looked up because for one moment I thought maybe he had come to regain consciousness, but he didn't. And I looked up and the ambulance driver told me that something told him we were in love and so he locked our hands together. And I remember thanking him. And I remember just pleading with God, please don't let me go under again. Don't let me go unconscious because I knew I'd never see him again. I fought so hard not to go unconscious, but I did. And that was the last time I ever saw him. He lived eight hours, as you know, and then he died. I was in a hospital for a long time. The formula is really very simple. Just follow the rules. And you will see And as life travels on And things do go wrong Just follow steps one, two, and three Well, that sure sounds like heaven to me This is the actual spot where it all happened, back in 1960. If we just bow our heads and have just this minute silence in memory of Eddie Cochran, I think, uh, I think that speaks for itself. I think so it job. If we have a minute silence. This is Eddie's guitar. It's electric guitar. He bought this in uh, Bell Gardens Music Center. I think they're they're not in business anymore. And it has a uh, Bigsby tremolo on it right here. I keep this in a, in a special case that uh, my husband and I had made just for his guitar and his amp and uh, his guns and knives. What about his room? Tell us about that. His room? The one that he had here in this house is my room now. I sleep in his room now. I, I, uh, after uh, my husband died, why, uh, I moved into uh, Eddie's room. And I, that's where the uh, case is. And uh, my pictures. What's the room like? Have you changed it at all? Well, it's a small room. 
It has a twin bed in it. And, uh, but it's large enough for me. And it's close to the small bath, and that's why I wanted that room. Is any of Eddie's stuff still in there? Some of it is. And some of it is in my cedar chest in the back bedroom. I have never been able to uh, get rid of it. I didn't get all of his clothes back, of course, you know. But uh, what I did get, I, sa I have saved. Is anybody allowed into the room? No. No one. Jean, I want to talk about uh, a young man that you knew. He was your friend, Eddie Cochran. Uh, yes, Jim. He, he was he was more or less like a brother to me. He, he w We hung around together, and we went, you know, almost every place together. And when we were in England, my, uh, you know, we, were, we traveled almost constantly together. Was this in the early 60s, Jean? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. You know, if Eddie was alive today, Jean, he would be uh, very happy to know that his recordings are still being played. Well, I hope wherever he's at, I hope he right. knows that they're being played, because he was a very fun-loving fellow. He was a very good fellow. I think you, if you could have met him, you'd have liked him very much. Last year, which is 81, like, the 21st anniversary of Cochrane, well, we put the sun on in the garden here, and uh, the, oak, the oak tree behind you. And um, this is all in memory of Eddie Cochrane, like, yeah. Watch it good. You understand? Mm -hmm. Watch it good. Yes, Mr. Murdoch. Ooh, well, I've got to get over the record machine when it comes to rockin'. She's the queen. We'll love the dance on a Saturday night. All alone where I can hold her tight, but she lives on the 20th floor of town. 
The elevator's broken down, so I walk one Flight three, flight four, five, six, seven, flight eight, flight more Up on the twelfth, I'm starting to drag Fifty to four, I'm already to sag Get to the top, I'm too tired to rock Well, she calling me up on the telephone She come on over, honey, I'm all alone I said, baby, you're mighty sweet But I'm in bed with the aching feet This went on for a couple of days But I couldn't stay away So I walked one, two, five, three, five, four About six, seven, five, eight, five more Up on the twelfth, I'm ready to drag A fifteenth, the four, where I'm starting to say Get to the top, I'm too tired to rock Well, I sent to Chicago for repairs Till it's a fixed, I'm using the stairs All this climbing is getting me down To find my corpse draped over a rail But I climb one, two, five, three, five, four Five, six, seven, flat, eight, flat, more Up on the twelfth, I'm ready to drag Well, the fifteenth floor, I'm starting to sag Get to the top, I'm too tired to rock Why does he want us to watch him? 